In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today is the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, in which we contemplate the highest of all mysteries, the mystery of one God in three persons. The Catholic belief concerning the Holy Trinity was summarized by the Fourth Lateran Council in these words. Firmly we believe and we confess simply that the true God is one alone, eternal, immense, and unchangeable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, and ineffable, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, three persons indeed, but one essence, substance or nature, absolutely simple. The Father from no one, the Son from the Father only, and the Holy Ghost equally from both, without beginning, always, and without end. The Father generating, the Son being born, and the Holy Ghost proceeding, consubstantial and co-equal and omnipotent, and co-eternal, one beginning of all, creator of all visible and invisible things. <laughs> now a mystery in general is a reality or truth that is secret, hidden, and surpassing our understanding, but is worthy to be known. <clears throat> and for a divine mystery in the strict sense, three things are required. First, that the truth be hidden in God. Second, that it cannot be known except by divine revelation. And third, that the truth remain obscure even after it has been revealed. Now all these conditions are evidently fulfilled in the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. That this truth is hidden in God is clear since it is the mystery of the intimate life of God as he is in himself. That it cannot be known without revelation may be deduced from the nature of the mystery and is also the teaching of the Church. Finally, that the truth of this mystery remains obscure even after its having been revealed Besides being the teaching of the Church, the Holy Fathers and theologians, is something confirmed by experience. <clears throat> For although we know with the greatest certainty that there are three distinct persons in God, but a single and in indivisible nature, still we know this as though through a glass, in a dark manner, to use the words of St. Paul. We know it not by seeing it with the mind and grasping it, but by faith on the testimony and authority of God who reveals it. We believe the mystery, but cannot comprehend it with our mind. The reason for this is that a supernatural mystery cannot be known Although, excuse me, although it can be known by revelation, it can never be comprehended by any creature. This is a mystery to be believed and adored rather than to be scrutinized. For he who attempts to curiously scrutinize it is blinded by the divine splendor, just as he who looks directly at the midday sun blinds himself. We must here call to mind the words of Ecclesiasticus. Seek not the things that are too high for thee, and search not into things above thy ability. For it is not necessary for thee to see with thy eyes those things that are hid. And the Apostle teaches the same thing when he says that we should not seek to know more than it, it is fitting for us to know. Let us then recall today 
the truth to be known by all Christians concerning this mystery. In one divine nature, there are three persons, the Father begotten of none, the Son begotten of the Father before all ages, the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son, likewise from all eternity. In the one substance of the divinity, the Father is the first person who, with his only begotten Son and the Holy Ghost, is one God and one Lord, not in the singularity of one person, but in the trinity of one substance, as the Church says in today's preface. The three divine persons are equal in all things, there being no per person older, more powerful, or in any way superior to another, for this is a heresy. These three persons are distinct one from another only in their respective, respective properties. For the Father is unbegotten, the Son begotten of the Father, and the Holy Ghost proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Thus we acknowledge the essence and the substance of the three persons to be the same. And while we confess the true and the eternal God, we must likewise adore the true distinction in the persons, the unity in the essence, and the equality in the Trinity. Hence, when we say that the Father is the first person, we in no way mean that in the Trinity there is anything first or last, greater or less, for the Christian religion proclaims the same eternity, the same majesty of the glory in the three persons. But since the Father is the beginning without a beginning, we truly and rightly affirm that he is the first person. And as he is distinct from the others by his peculiar relation of paternity, so of him alone it is true that he begot the Son from eternity. For in the Creed, when we say together the words God and Father, it means that he was always both God and Father. And similarly, the Son is called the second person and the Holy Ghost the, the third, not to show any order of time or of superiority, but only to show that the Son proceeds from the Father and the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son. <clears throat> but, as I said before, these are truths which should not be the subject of a too subtle and curious investigation, since, as the Holy Ghost says in Proverbs, he who is a searcher of majesty shall be overwhelmed by glory. We should then be satisfied with the absolute certitude which faith gives, and that is, and that is based in the fact that these truths we have been taught by God, to doubt whose word is extreme folly, since he can neither deceive nor be deceived. Now, before we see the testimonies of Revelation in particular, we should consider why it was fitting that the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity be expressed in the Old Testament in the Old Testament in an obscure manner and be revealed clearly and explicitly in the New Testament. The principal reason is found in the mystery of the Incarnation, in which we confess that the Son of God assumed human flesh and was conceived in the womb of a virgin by the power of the Holy Ghost. This mystery could not be grasped without the explicit revelation of the mystery of the three divine persons. But in the Old Testament, 
there was not so great a need for an explicit revelation of the mystery of the Trinity. Indeed, there was danger that the rude and illiterate people, not understanding the loftiness of the mystery, would believe that there were more than one God. Nevertheless, the mystery was expressed, though not in an explicit manner. A certain plurality in one God is suggested by the words of God himself before the creation of man. Let us make man to our likeness. And as God reproves Adam for his prevarication, he says, <clears throat> Behold, Adam is become as one of us. Again, before he confounds the design of the builders of the Tower of Babel because of their pride, he says, Come ye, therefore, let us go down and there confound their tongue. Moreover, in the formula which the priests had to use for blessing the people, the Trinity is obscurely foreshadowed in the fact that the name of the Lord had to be repeated three dis distinct times. Isaiah, moreover, tells us that, in the, that the seraphim in heaven cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of hosts. And David, under divine inspiration, says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand, by which a divine person is signified, who is as truly Lord as the Father is Lord. And in more general terms, the Trinity is foreshadowed in the Old Testament in the fact that, on the one hand, the Jews professed a perfect monotheism, and on the other hand, the books of the Old Testament speak of a second person who is called Wisdom and the Messiahs, and also of the Holy Ghost. Now this mystery already foreshadowed in the Old Testament was clearly expressed in the New Testament, first in the baptism of Christ. St. Luke, speaking of our Lord's baptism by St. John the Baptist in the Jordan, says, Now it came to pass, when all the people were baptized, that Jesus also being baptized and praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape as a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Here the Father manifested himself by a voice, the Son was seen in the flesh, and the Holy Ghost was visible in the form of a dove, so that it might be signified that the faith of the Holy Trinity was now to be unfolded, and that the baptism of Christ was to be conferred in the name of the three divine persons. <clears throat> but the mystery of the Trinity is proclaimed still more explicitly. Thus, St. John says, And there are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Likewise, when the Savior commissioned his apostles to preach the gospel throughout the world, he said to them, Go in therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We have seen how the mystery of the Trinity exceeds the capacity of our understanding, being, as it is, infinitely above all created things. And yet, by sanctifying grace, we are, in very truth, 
made partakers of this ineffable life of the Trinity. For our Lord has said, If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and will make our abode with him. And together with the Son, with the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost also makes his abode in the soul in grace. We see from this the incomparable value of sanctifying grace, how compared to it all the natural good of the universe is as nothing, because grace makes us partake in the blessed life of the Trinity, a thing that is above all description and comprehension. And it is this same sanctifying grace and it alone that will be changed into glory and make us, as we hope, see the blessed Trinity as it is in itself. And as a necessary consequence, be inebriated with its love according to that of the Son. They shall be inebriated with the plenty of thy house and thou shalt make them drink of the torrent of thy pleasure. For with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light we shall see the light. The joy, the blessedness that those who die in the state of grace shall enjoy for all eternity is beyond all description, since it will be based in the sight, the fruition, and the love of the blessed Trinity. It will be a participation of that supernatural bliss that the three divine persons enjoy for, from all eternity. This will be the blossoming, so to speak, of sanctifying grace into eternal glory. Truly then, grace is an, in, an inestimable treasure. But, as the Apostle warns us, we have this, this treasure in earthen vessels, in the fragile vessel of our body. If we break our vessel by a mortal sin, the oil of charity is immediately lost, and woe to us if we do not recover it. For it was only those virgins who had their lamp ready with oil who were allowed to go and follow the bridegroom and enter into the marriage feast, which is a figure of heaven. And they that were ready, our Lord says in the parable, went in, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. But at last came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answering said, Amen, I say to you, I know you not. Let us then do our utmost to recover if we have lost it and to pre preserve this treasure of grace, this oil of charity. Let us fear mortal sin more than death and hence cast off all occasions of it. Because it is only sin that, that can deprive us of sin, loving and enjoying the ineffable company of the Blessed Trinity for all eternity. May our Lord, through the intercession of his Holy Mother, grant us this grace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.